Welcome to The Lover's Hole, where we're rereading the Aubrey Matron books of Patrick O'Brien. We're in the midst of the far side of the world. Ian, can you catch us up with where we were and tell us where we're headed this time? Mike, I'd love to do that. Last time out, the surprise and her crew had been recovering on Juan Fernandez Island and had lost track of Mrs. Horner and Holland the midshipman. And we learned that this was a pretty grim outcome. The gunner Horner had killed his wife and killed Holland and later hanged himself. There was a potential prize. That turned out to be a Spanish merchantman who guided the surprise in turn towards the Galapagos in search of the USS Norfolk, which has been their target, their chase all along. They had recaptured this whaler called Acapulco. They had taken on much needed supplies in the form of cordage and sails and spars, and they had met the Norfolk's captain's nephew who had guided them towards the Marquesas as a great place where they might further their search for the Norfolk. So that's where we were last time. This time, Mike, Jack's going to be searching the Galapagos Islands for the USS Norfolk. We're going to hear about wildlife. We're going to hear about mating rituals and gobstoppers, probably not in the same sentence. Stephen is going to become very angry with Jack for a familiar reason, and we're going to learn that skipping a night of music can have disastrous results, following which Stephen and Jack become part of a new crew and the book develops much differently than the movie. Thanks again. Yeah, it, it, it's a real point of departure here, although we've had several up leading up to this. Yeah. And also, Mike, this time we get to dig into the world of naval history. We're going to spend time with the curator of the oldest sailing ship afloat in Europe. We're going to spend time today talking to Claire Hunt from the National Museum of the Royal Navy in Hartlepool. Well, when we start the chapter, the surprise is already there in the Galapagos Islands, and they're kind of threading through some of these narrow channels between islands looking for the Norfolk. And, and O'Brien uh, really enjoys giving us a description of these islands. And it's, it's kind of eerie, a little otherworldly, all this like, volcanic ash and rock, strange plant life, and what O'Brien calls a low and troubled sky. And we know that this is always O'Brien's way of kind of setting us up thing. Is, is it beautiful and blue up above? No, it's low and troubled here. So Jack and his crew, they're just creeping in between these islands because they don't want to accidentally leave the Norfolk sort of hiding somewhere here. They're navigating these treacherous breezes and currents. And this is not at all to Jack's taste. And the crew no. is, is on edge. Everybody is prepared for the immediate threat on the one hand of a lee shore and, and on the other hand of, of a racing tide, you know, coming out. So they kind of have these cross currents going against them here. Yeah. And it's kind of creeping inshore, shallow water navigation. As you say, Mike, it's not Jack's thing at all. It's not the crew's thing either, because everybody's watching gravely as disaster could strike at any hand, except for, of course, our two friends, the surgeon and the chaplain, Stephen Maturin and Martin, are, it says, either ignorant of the implications of tide rip, unplumbed depth, uncertain breeze, and want of sea room, or soaring above these things. And guess where they were soaring? They were soaring with the birds and the beasts. They had observed, we learn, the courtship and mating ritual of boobies. Such a well-chosen bird for this episode rituals of boobies these were steven's favorite he had long been anticipating much earlier in the book he had been looking forward to encountering the blue faced booby as well as o'brien says seals eared seals sea lions and sea bears i might i i had to sort of stop and bump for a second on sea bears and if james albright is listening and wants to fill us in on sea bears we'd love to hear from you james but it seems to us that maybe the sea bear is well, first of all, it's nothing to do with SpongeBob SquarePants because you Google sea bear <laughs> and for some reason the internet takes you to SpongeBob SquarePants. But I'm going to guess that a sea bear refers to the Galapagos fur seal, which is smaller than a sea lion, like you would think, a slightly furry face, furry head. And its Latin name means bear-headed in the sense of headed like a bear. We found some photos that certainly make it look bear-like and we'll tweet those out through the week. Nice. Anyhow, Mike, we've got all this nice natural history ashore with the seals and the sea lions and the sea bears. The blue-faced booby that several times in the book Stephen and Martin have looked forward to encountering is actually not found on the Galapagos, whereas 
Everybody on the internet knows that O'Brien's favorite booby is the blue-footed booby. So I wonder if Patrick O'Brien, in this case, has momentarily lost control of his boobies. Maybe. (laughs) Just might be. That's right. Well, speaking of which, Stephen and Martin you know, are, are there with their glasses trained and they're watching this pair of boobies kind of racing through their mating ritual much faster than they've ever seen before. Yeah. And they have it cut short at the last moment because they're performing this on the back of a big turtle, which all of a sudden starts to submerge as they really get busy here. And, uh, and which of us hasn't had that problem, to be honest? Oh, yeah. that's, <laughs> right. that's why we never pick a giant tortoise as, as that honeymoon <laughs> spot. Right. Well, this causes Stephen to start to muse on courtship and mating. And Stephen says, I've been contemplating on the mating ceremonies of our own kind. Sometimes they're almost as brief as the boobies, as when two of a like inclination exchange kind looks and after a short parley retire from view. I'm thinking of Herodotus and his account of the Greek and Amazon warriors in the pause after their truce for dinner when individuals from either army would wander among the bushes and of some more recent examples that have fallen under my own observation. So wonder, wonder what Stephen's thinking of there. Maybe I'll, Mm, Mrs. Horner, perhaps. Somebody beginning with H, perhaps. Perhaps so. (laughs) Stephen goes on. At other times, however, the evolutions of the ceremonial dance with its feigned advances and feigned withdrawals, its ritual offerings and symbolic motions are protracted beyond measure, lasting perhaps for years before the right true end is reached, if indeed it is reached at all and not spoiled entirely by the long delay. And now I think, hmm, hmm, who could this be? Stephen and Diana, perhaps? <laughs> yeah. And it's funny. Like, Stephen seems to be musing. He likes to muse on these kind of subjects anyway. And for him, it's just a little bit of, I think, self-reflection and introspection. But Martin kind of takes it a little bit deeper and darker. He agrees that this idea of, you know, studying courtship and mating is a fascinating topic. Martin says, I wonder some writer has not made it his particular study. And I guess that's a little writerly joke there from O'Brien. Because, you know, Mike, you could argue that, you know, the courtship and mating rituals are the study of just about every writer since the ancient Greeks one way or another. Um, And maybe that's a reference to O'Brien himself. And then Martin finishes off. He says, the ceremony, I mean, not the act itself, which is nasty, brutish, and short. And Mike, that that phrase made me kind of stop and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. We, We hear this many, many times. First of all, this is not a phrase that people use to describe the act of love. This is a phrase that people use to describe, you know, life and death. And oh, poor old repressed Nathaniel Martin, poor repressed cynical guy. What a, what a phrase to use to describe the act of love. Anyway, um, we dig into this and we discover that this phrase, nasty British and short, which I've heard loads of times, actually comes from Thomas Hobbes, 16th century English political philosopher Thomas Hobbes. And we're back in the world of political philosophers of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment again, you know, just like Rousseau and all those guys. And in his treatise, Leviathan, Hobbes wrote this. He said, whatsoever, therefore, is consequent to a time of war where every man is enemy to every man, the same is consequent to the time wherein men live without other security than what their own strength and their own invention shall furnish them withal. In such condition, there is no place for industry because the fruit thereof is uncertain and consequently no culture of the earth, no navigation, nor use of the commodities that may be imported by sea. This is sounding like O'Brien, isn't it? Right. Um, no commodious building, no instruments of moving and removing such things as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, Jack Aubrey and his navigation, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society. And remember, this is all Hobbes describing the terrible condition of being at war. And which is worst of all, he says, continual fear and danger of violent death. Here it comes. And the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And there's there's no way Hobbes is thinking about sex here. 
No. And it's, it's a fascinating o- O'Brien-ish reference. We've got all of this kind of enlightenment cynicism about the purpose and futility of war. We've got all this connection to authority and hierarchy because Hobbes was writing about society and authority. He was trying to reverse a position he'd taken earlier on where he said, in an England gripped by civil war, he was no longer happy to say that people could not be governed by consent and be governed by a king. And also, O'Brien is using the quote, I think, to reintroduce his old favorite idea that in some respects, being in a relationship, being in a loving relationship is analogous to being at war. So there's all kinds of stuff going on here. Right. You know, and we, we've, we've heard this come up time and again. And meanwhile, something else that we've seen come up before, birds are landing all over the ship, right? Oh. And Howard, the Marine, we remember him shooting indiscriminately before, has, has stopped that now. And we learn that now... He's more selectively dispatching birds for eating and for Stephen's specimen collection. Uh, And and O'Brien tells us that his more restrained manner is thanks to Matron's influence and what uh, O'Brien called the weight of public opinion. So I guess Stephen had won a few people around here. As Howard is delivering the birds, Martin spots two giant tortoises, along with all this other wildlife that they're watching. And Martin just is ecstatic about all the discoveries they're about to make on these islands, given all the nondescripts they've already found, including and amongst these birds here. And Stephen assures Martin that Jack has promised them time to explore. Once they found the Norfolk, they're going to take their time on the Galapagos. And Stephen, of course, is looking through his glass at this these tortoises here and comparing them to Testudo Aubrey, one of our favorites, right? Mm-hmm. The turtle, yeah, that he discovered and named after Jack in the Indian Ocean. But all this close attention to nature and lingering and prognostication about love and war and sex is just good old O'Brien sleight of hand diversion because we're about to get a plot point. A foreign vessel has been sighted. Stephen and Nathaniel Martin go, oh, they're they're shouting about something. What's it going to be? It's a boat. It's a boat. A boat heaves around the corner here in the Galapagos. It's a boat from a whaler pulling rapidly towards the surprise. And the boat, we learn, came from a British whaler, the intrepid Fox of London. And they come aboard and they tell their story. They've been separated from their ship in the fog. They've been pulled away by a big, aggressive, strong whale. They returned a day later to discover their ship, the Intrepid Fox, being pulled apart by an American frigate. That's going to be our friend, the Norfolk, who in turn set the Intrepid Fox afire and let it burn to the ground. Meanwhile, our whaler crew having hidden themselves away, stayed on the island. They watched the Americans as they loaded tortoise upon tortoise aboard from the island and had left. And we get a really interesting new job title. We hear that one of the whalers has the job of being the specioneer. And Mike, specioneer, that's that's a special whaling term? It, it is. It, it, it's the chief harpooner and also the person who supervises cutting up the speck, or as we would say, the blubber. So an engram 1827 hit here. Good. And then you, you know, you, you've got your Deutsche. Uh... Yeah, yeah, meine Deutsche Kenntnisse habe ich schon. That Speck is also German for fat, especially for pork fat. Speck is what the specksioneer was responsible for taking care of. The blubber, the fat from the carcass of the whale. So Jack, of course, like any good commanding officer, enters the boat's crew on the ship's books. He takes it for completely for granted that they're happy to be kind of impressed. I don't think right. he's got a choice, really. And he says, of course, these guys won't be won't mind be going on the books as rated able seamen, because, of course, they're all prime hands on the whaling trade. And he sets the surprise up to head directly for the Marquesas. So this nice, lingering exploration of the Galapagos is cut short as they head off to the Marquesas, with not a moment to lose. Moat is concerned that they aren't stopping to get tortoise meat, but Moat doesn't know the half of it. (laughs) Mike, it wasn't just Moat who had a moment's anxiety about leaving the Galapagos, right? No, 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 no. You know, word gets to Stephen, and he is absolutely incensed that they're not stopping, as Jack had promised him. And, and, you know, he's talking to Jack about this, and Jack says that his promise was subject to the requirements of the service. Stephen gets even anger and and he's sort of you know talking to Jack saying, well, look, you've got to go all the way around this island and then come all the way back again. It's a short thing. Martin and I can just walk across. And Jack's saying, well, you know, if if I didn't have such favorable, you know, tide and winds and everything right now, I would do that. But but I can't, you know, the wind and tide are in my favor, Stephen. We just have to go. And he, he knows that Stephen 
probably likely to lose track of time there. But Stephen is not having any of this. And Stephen mm-hmm. replies, well, sir, I must submit to superior force. I find I must be content to form part of a merely belligerent expedition, hurrying past inestimable pearls, bent solely on destruction, neglecting all discovery, incapable of spending five minutes on discovery. I shall say nothing about the corruption of power or its abuse. I shall only observe that for my part, I look upon a promise as binding, and that until the present, I must confess it had never occurred to me that you might not be of the same opinion, that you might have two words. Ah, Stephen's hot. Stephen is hot. <laughs> and, he's, he's more than a little ticked off. This is this is the real deal. <laughs> right. And, and Jack comes back to him, right? Yeah. My promise, says Jack, was necessarily conditional. And you kind of get the sense, well, it's not described, but I get the sense of Jack going quite kind of cautious and formal and kind of mm. almost cold here. My promise was necessarily conditional, said Jack. I command a king's ship, not a private yacht. You are forgetting yourself. Then much more kindly and with a smile. And Jack, of course, this is his friend and he wants to rebuild the bridge. But I tell you what it is, Stephen. I shall keep in as close with the shore as can be and you shall look at the creatures with my best achromatic glass, reaching for a splendid five-lens Dolland, an instrument that Stephen was never allowed to use because of his tendency to drop telescopes into the sea. And we discover that this little... Olive branch, this attempt to kind of leaven and lighten the situation cuts no ice at all with Stephen. You may take your achromatic glass and, oh, don't we wish Stephen could finish the sentence, but we have a pretty good idea what he was going to say. Right. <laughs> he checked himself and after the slightest pause went on, you are very good, but I have one of my own. I shall trouble you no longer. Whoa. Hot. It's not great, is it? No. Stephen leaves Jack's cabin And over time, he becomes even angrier when he realizes that almost everybody on board, not just his friends, you know, Bondin and Killick and Joe Place and Padine, others that he saved, but as O'Brien writes here, recent defenders and the mere children of the midshipman's birth surrounded him with exceptional kindness and particular attention. He had always prided himself on maintaining the Volta I should probably let you take this one. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try a Volta Sciolto Pensieri Stretti. Yes, thank you, Ian. Tony Soprano's favorite menu item. Yeah, the, exactly, exactly. So I'll, I'll I'll quickly pick this up. You know, we we ran across this back in the Ionian mission. Remember, Mister Waterhouse, who was one of Sir Joseph Blaine's intelligence agents that was helping Admiral Thornton. He was described this same way. It means open face and concealed thoughts. This idea that. Everybody should think you are kind of wide open, but in fact, you kind of keep everything, what you're actually thinking and believing and everything inside. But they they think you're wide open. We had talked about it then about a letter from the Earl of Chesterfield as kind of advice to his son. But, you know, so Stephen thought as an intelligence agent that this is how he is. You know, it doesn't matter what he's feeling and thinking. Nobody can detect that he's got this poker face. But he's very proud of his deadpan. Yeah, exactly. But in fact, it's not. So O'Brien finishes, you know, he felt like he'd kept that better than most men. And here were the illiterate tarpaulins comforting him for a distress which he could have sworn was perfectly undetectable here. So poor Stephen. He is uh, he's not happy. He drugs himself, throws himself in bed, still angry, actually remembers to pray to be a little less rancorous (laughs) at the end. But at 2 a.m., Padine wakes him up because Mr. Blakeney has swallowed, it said, a four pound grape shot, you know, which sounds impossible. But it turns out only to be one of the nine balls in the grape shot. And and Stephen quickly dislodges it. Mm, Yes. And Mr. Blakeney doesn't seem to have become any worse for wear. Um, but and, and Stephen, I think, feels a little bit, a bit of a lift because he's probably saved this kid from, from a fatal fatal bowel complication. Yes. But we get the satisfying clang of the ball into the bowl. And the next day, speaking of eating things, which Mr. Blakeney clearly did badly, um, Stephen learns that Jack is coming as the gun room's guest to what he describes as a Lord Mayor's feast. And remember, we're still not far out of Juan Fernandez and not far out of the Galapagos. So they're all pretty well found for livestock and provisions and fresh 
fresh produce. Stephen is not pleased at the idea that he's going to have to look friendly and at ease in the company of Jack when he's still really fuming over being made to leave the Galapagos. He glances at Jack later and thinks how Jack and even other post captains, even Admiral Nelson, hung about in port for adultery without any scruple and no, no nonsense about it being a king's ship. And these scruples, he thinks, seem to be reserved for natural philosophy and discovery. His soul to the devil. This is a classic Stephen throwdown, isn't right. it? His soul to the devil. False hypocritical dog. I mean, only Russo gets gets cussed out as bad as this. False <laughs> hypocritical dog. But he's probably unaware of his falsity. Pravum est cor omnium. The heart is perverse above all things and unsearchable. So, Mike, but this is a, an unusual bit of Latin here. Where's this coming from? Well, it's funny. Here's one that's it's straight up Latin. It's Latin from the Fallgate Bible. And O'Brien has actually provided his own translation here. You know, that, that he gave us the Latin and then O'Brien's text there is essentially up translation. The, the New International Version would say, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? So I, I think Stephen's realizing that you know, perhaps Jack does not see his own double standards, doesn't mean this personally towards Stephen. I, I think his his prayers are paying off a little bit here. He's yeah. softening a bit. And everybody needs a dose of Jeremiah every now and again, don't they, to bring them to their senses. He was oh, good. my gosh. Well, and one of the better horse references in the Bible. And, and, <laughs> and then again, there was always Jeremiah as a bullfrog from, <laughs> from yes. yes. I think different Jeremiah, though. Oh, could be, could be. So uh, Stephen's taken along with this, and he realizes that he's also under a bit of a constraint because he's meant to look like he's playing a part in this hospitable scene, this hospitable dinner. Right. And he eventually forces himself through gritted teeth, I think, to say, a glass of wine with you, sir, and bows to Jack and drinks a glass of wine. And we know that this is an important social moment in Regency kind of table manners, and it's probably an important moment, we've got to hope, in the thawing of this discord between Jack and Stephen. Jack goes on to congratulate Stephen on saving Blakeney, the guy who swallowed the uh, the grape shot. And Martin wonders aloud, as Martin is wont to do kind of innocently, why Blakeney had the ball in his mouth in the first place. And Jack explains the culture of the barbarity of midshipmen. He says that in his youth, they would make youngsters who talk too much hold one in their mouth. They called it a gobstopper. And my go- gobstopper is a word from my youth. Gobstopper is hard, big, round candy that you suck, and it you, know, you can't talk while you're sucking on a on a gobstopper. Um, in Ngram, gobstopper's actually got a really recent peak of 2017, and we also had its usage in uh, Roald Dahl's book, Willy Wonka and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory back in 1976. So gobstopper, it's got a bit of a checkered history. Right, right, right. So meanwhile, the meal goes well. They have a capital meal. And we read that Stephen noticed, not without irritation, but as he ate and drank, his civility was growing less artificial. His deliberately urbane expression, more nearly a spontaneous smile, that he was nearly in danger of enjoying himself. <laughs> ah, he can't help himself, even though he's cantankerous and he's pissed off with Jack. He can't help himself, but kind of feeling mollified. And Mike, there's, there's, there's a moment here. I'm just going to pick up a little moment for the followers of the movie. Because the movie has surprise spending some time around the Galapagos. Not quite the episode with the musket ball, though. We have a wide ranging of discussion and we have a, a very, fairly dubiously tasteful pig joke from the Marine Lieutenant Howard. And we have a sacred snippet translated from the Malay by Stephen until here's the moment for the movie fans. Pudding arrives. A floating island made at you know some sort of ingenuity and in expense in spun sugar and kind of dessert stuff to make itself look just like the Galapagos. Jack is very taken by it and promises that they'll come back after they complete the mission as he prepares to cut the line. This little moment of physical theatre where he cuts this sponge sugar line of latitude that is the equator. And in the movie, lots of you might remember, Russell Crowe kind of overdoes it. He he dives in, scoops up one entire island in a spoon and gobbles it down in one mouthful. And I know there are lots of people who will forgive many things about the movie, but they really disliked that moment. Ah, but maybe it was just Russell Crowe and his characterization. Right, right. 
So, Mike, we're going to take a short break right now. When we come back, we're going to hear the interview that we had with Claire Hunt from the National Museum of the Royal Navy. And then afterwards, we'll hear what's going to happen with the surprise and the specksioneer and the Norfolk. Well, I think that's a great idea, and it'll give Russell Crowe time to chew that mouthful he's just taken. Yeah. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lubbers hole. So now it's time for us to listen to the chat I had just a few days ago with our new friend Claire Hunt from the National Museum of the Royal Navy. So we're really excited today to welcome Claire Hunt. Claire is currently Senior Curator at National Museum of the Royal Navy at Hartlepool in the northeast of England. Claire is responsible for the care and management of the Restore Frigate HMS Trincomalee, alongside the the wider team of other senior curators that work in other parts of the NMRN network. So Claire, tell us about yourself. Tell us how does someone become to be a Senior Curator at a Naval Museum? Well, I um, started in Hartlepool about five years ago now. Mm -hmm. And the role then was called curator of HMS Trincomalee. And I actually came from um, South End Museum Service down in Essex. Mm-hmm. So I had some experience of maritime collections, not naval, but mm-hmm. maritime, mainly art, to be honest, but also shipwrecks, shipwreck material. I also looked after historic houses, which... Um, they're actually very similar in terms of conservation and continuing care. So timber framed houses, very similar to a timber framed ship. There's a big emphasis on conservation in the role. So although I didn't have that Royal Navy background, they weren't really looking for someone like that. They were looking for someone who could look after the ship and the collections, interpret it and also, you know, obviously learn it as, as they went along. So it sounds like for you, the history came first and then ships as a consequence of that. Is that fair? Yeah. I mean, actually, art history was my degree. And okay. I started off um, as a fine art curator in South End, And a lot of that was maritime art. And, yeah, the art gallery overlooked the estuary, you know, so it was quite immersed in it, really. Um, so it's, it felt like quite a natural progression. I, I curated all types of collections, to be honest. Yeah. And um, I'm a sort of sort of curator that will um, get interested in anything that's thrown at me however <laughs> weird and obscure so um, yeah it was it was fine for me uh, I was quite surprised that I did get the role because I thought oh they're, they're going to want a naval historian you know but yeah. actually that wasn't the point of the of the job. So you're looking after HMS Trincomalee a frigate Floating in a in a dock in Hartlepool in the northeast of England. Tell us a bit about HMS Trincomalee because it seems to me that her, her size and provenance has got some connection to the HMS Surprise that's in the uh, in the Patrick O'Brien books. Yeah, well, she's um, a lady class frigate. Um, she was actually built in, in India. Mm-hmm. There were there was a run of ships built in India for the Royal Navy yeah. by the um, Honourable East India Company at the Bombay Dockyard. Mm-hmm. And there were, there were about 30 ships built specifically for the Royal Navy during the early to mid 19th century, yeah. Trincomalee being one of those. And she was built there and then subsequently came back to Britain like most did. And she didn't go into commission until the 1840s. Obviously, she, she was actually commissioned herself when there was still... Uh, America had, had come into the wars and she was she was really built I think for that aspect of the Napoleonic Wars but of course in the in the period during her build of course building these ships takes a few years um, who was to know that you know it's pretty much over by the time she was launched so she was put into ordinary laid up in ordinary which means she was basically roofed over in Portsmouth and yeah. um preserved, looked after for for whenever she may be needed again. And that actually wasn't until the 1840s. So by the time she went into commission, she was an old fashioned ship. Yeah. You know, she she was out of date really. Um, but there were some modifications done at that point in time to, to put her to sea. And um, she patrolled 
basically patrolled the empire. She she went many hundreds of thousands of miles. She did mm. anti-slavery duties. She was looking after the economic interests of the empire, yeah. all sorts of things. No dramatic battles or anything like that. <laughs> but, you know, she did what, to be honest, most of the ships for the Royal Navy were doing at that point, and that was just being a presence, being impressive, frightening yeah. the locals, <laughs> looking after the interests of the empire. Right. So I think you mentioned that there's a, a bit of a coincidence in time with the building of the Trincomalee and the arrival of the Americans in the 1812 war. As I say, um, Trincomalee was commissioned in about 1812 yeah. and HMS Java was carrying the plans for Trincomalee and her sister Amphitrite yeah. to, um, and she was going to be bound for Bombay. Yeah. And this was when HMS Java was actually attacked and sunk by Constitution. Uh-huh. So... There is a little bit of rivalry there. She almost didn't come come about at all because of the constitution, but eventually the the plans got sent out again, and that was why she was delayed in the end. Oh wow! So mm-hmm. rivalry is there still any rivalry between NMRN and Trincomalee and constitution <laughs> over in Boston these days in the world? Well, of we do feel a little bit of rivalry. Um, certainly, when I started at um, Hartlepool. People were sort of saying that Trincomalee was the oldest warship afloat because Constitution was at that point in dry dock. Yeah. Um, and then a couple of years down the line, we could no longer say that. So we now say that um, Trincomalee is the oldest warship afloat in Europe, which is a bit of a mouthful. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> I think what we could probably say really about um, Trincomalee is that she's the only remaining ship built in India for the Royal Navy. And uh, I think that's probably the biggest sort of unique selling point, to be honest. Readers of the books will remember that HMS Surprise got a big refit in Bombay. Would that have had a bearing on the materials or the construction of Trincomalee? Is there anything to see of her India heritage in the ship as she is now? Yes, definitely. I mean, there's nothing... um, Uh, completely obvious but she is built of teak and that is one of the key reasons why these ships were built in India was that they had this uh, these magnificent forests of Malabar teak and so as well as the ship the very skilled um, shipwrights that they had in Bombay there there was this this materials as well so you know together with the, the skills and the materials they really made very you know really first class ships and actually it's very much the reason why Trincomalee survives is, is the teak build mm. because teak really doesn't rot like um, oak does. I mean, anyone who's got a teak, people have said to me before, I've got a teak table in my um, back garden <laughs> and um, there's not a mark on it and my other things have totally rotted. And it's like, yeah, teak, it just, it's very, very waterproof. It's quite an oily wood, very hard wood. Yeah. And, the other interesting thing about it is because it doesn't rot, it's not subject to wood boring pests either. Oh, right. So um, things like um, shipworm and yeah. death watch beetle, yeah. shipworm below the waterline, death watch beetle above the waterline, um, they tend to attack wood that's already a little bit soft and a little bit rotten. So yeah. um, because you don't tend to get that, I mean, we don't have, there isn't a whole in Trincomalee because she's teak. Wow. And Victory, by contrast, is made of oak, is that right? Victory is oak, as were um, all the ships built in Britain, and yeah. yet they have a constant battle with decay and death watch beetle. Um, yeah. Victory, one of her main issues is, is death watch beetle. So we might come back to the, sort of the materials and the archaeology side of it in yeah. a second, but help us finish off the story of the Trincomalee. How does a Napoleonic-era frigate come to what is now a sort of quiet 20th century port town in the northeast of England, seemingly a long way away from the traditional heart of the Royal Navy. Yeah, well, she did um, She did spend a few years in Hartlepool, actually, when she was still with the Royal Navy in the 1870s. Oh. Yeah. She was sent up to the northeast um, as, a, as a training ship for the Royal Navy and um, started off in Sunderland and then moved down to Hartlepool. There is a very old photograph of her in Sunderland. Um, she was in Hartlepool for a few years 
and they welcome they really welcomed her the locals actually and um when it was sort of mooted that she was going to be moved back to Portsmouth um there was a real battle to keep her yeah. I think they felt like it was um a great thing to have one of the the Royal Navy vessels there but unfortunately she did she was towed back down uh, ended up in Southampton water yeah. um, for her last years. Yeah, she was there while she was serving in the Royal yeah. Navy for a few years. But I don't think that had any bearing on how she ended up in Hartlepool. She ended up there because the the team that restored HMS Warrior yeah. uh, in the 80s were based in Hartlepool, um, yeah. the Historic Ship Restoration Company. And Hartlepool, previously being a very big shipbuilding area you know there were still those skills around there and when warrior was finished and taken back down to Portsmouth Trent Comley went up to have the the similar treatment so she was restored up there and although it was originally planned uh, she was owned by a trust at that point and they were did plan to get her restored and then take her back down she was I think there was all sorts of talk of her being in Portsmouth But while she was up in Hartlepool, there was also um, a a redevelopment of the area going on. And the development corporation at the time decided that actually she could be a key attraction up in Hartlepool. It would help with this development of the area. And that was negotiated. And um, there she stayed. Yeah. And she clearly is because that whole historic key area of Hartlepool and the marina is a big feature of how the town's grown in the last 20 years. Fantastic. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Ah. So I think you've said that your your interest is in the kind of physical preservation and curation. What what else have we learned about the history of the ship or the history of the people who sailed there from looking at the the, the materials that you find? Well, as I mentioned, she is um, she was completely teak built. Over yeah. the years, she has had uh, various modifications done. So she was modified in the eighteen forties before she went to sea by the Royal Navy, and their modifications they did in oak. Mm-hmm. So um, it's quite clear archaeologically you can sort of see what dates to what by what it's built in, basically. Right. So if it's teak, it's the original build. If it's oak, chances are it's going to be that modification. Right. Um, if it's something really bad and rotten and <laughs> s- some sort of softwood, it was w- after she left the Royal Navy and she was a, a, a privately owned training ship right. um, and they did tend to patch her up with whatever they could find <laughs> and they never really had very much money so there was quite often um, quite poor timbers used then yeah. so you can sort of trace those three different er- eras of her history by what she's made of something that we've discovered very recently um, that we didn't think she had was um, raised marks which are marks that are made when a ship's originally built um by the carpenters and it sometimes it's it's um it actually says who the carpenter was but sometimes it's about the where the timber is going and in the ship so it's to market so someone knows where it's destined um various various reasons why they would mark these timbers but um victory is absolutely chock full of raised marks it was something that portsmouth shipwrights did um, yeah. And the other surviving frigate, HMS Unicorn, um, she was built in Chatham. Yeah. She is chock full of raised marks as well. But um, Trincomalee, there were none to be seen. So we thought, well, clearly in Bombay, that isn't what they did. That wasn't their tradition. However, in recent years, we, in sort of very close investigations, and those of us who get on the ship regularly with a torch and crawl about and lie down and squint at things have found several raise marks. Wow. Um, And our sort of experts and raise marks, uh, Wessex archaeology, um, they're usually able to decipher them and they're, they are all from the 1840s, which was when she was obviously being modified in Portsmouth. So we know then that those timbers are, a, they're oak, and B, yeah. they're from, they were fitted in Portsmouth. So that's okay. that's a really nice, interesting, very um, recent discovery. Um, but we've also had some paint analysis done recently. Mm-hmm. Um, National Museum of the Royal Navy have done this on um, 
victory and yep. on Warrior. Yep. So I felt it was our turn on uh, <laughs> Trincomalee. So the paint analysis tends to take place on board, so inside the ship, because anything on the exterior will have been removed and, re- and repainted so many yep. times. There's generally nothing left. But inside, um, you can often get in between sort of two timbers, quite often a bit of old paint gathers, even if it's been stripped back many times. And uh, the um, generally a, a conservator who's a sort of expert in de- domestic interiors, they often do this in historic buildings as well, can take a sample of that paint and um, with their microscope, they can see each and every colour from um, beginning to end. Wow. I mean, obviously, at, at points where it's been completely stripped back to bare wood, um, sometimes they'll get very little. Um, but if they take it from the right places, they can find the original colour um, and then they can see every colour since. So there were a few instances. It would. It seems that Trincomalee was stripped back pretty bare when she was restored. Mm-hmm. Um but there are instances where they found below decks um, that she was originally painted a light blue oh. in the um, on the mess deck, oh. and we initially thought that would just be the officers' cabins. Um, as with Victory, they tended to be the officers' cabins that were painted an interesting colour, and everyone oh. else had to put up with lime wash. But actually, um, it was light blue throughout the mess. And um, our shipkeeper has informed me since that occasionally she she sees a flake of light blue come up um, when she's in the mess deck. So, um, yeah, um, quite interesting to know that because I don't think it would, would have been considered when she was restored that, well, this this has got to be baby blue. You know, you don't, you don't really tend to think. And if I remember rightly, the mess deck is now bare wood as people walk around it. The mess deck is actually um, a white, sort yeah. of so, white. So, are you are you thinking of restoring it to the to the baby blue one day? As a, I I think um, my next project is going to be that we must get below decks painted. Actually, the exterior of the ship is being painted as we speak. Yeah. She's just having a new coat of paint, um, but below decks, it's. Um, a much, much bigger and more involved job, surprisingly, because obviously you've got all these different timbers and it's a very, very complicated structure to, you know, rub back and paint. But um, it's going to be my mission that that she must be. (laughs) (laughs) And now we know what colours and finishes and so on. We know that certain areas that are now painted actually weren't. They They were varnished. Yeah. Um, so there were a few few things that we've learned from that. Oh, fantastic! I remember seeing and reading and hearing comments from people who saw the repainted Victory when her top sides were repainted, kind yeah. of horrified at what a strong and sort of nice colour it was. <laughs> That's right. I think um, some people were saying that it was pink. Yeah, um, exactly. yeah. There were all sorts of comments. Um, yeah, and, and most of the time, I think we expect these ships to just be completely practical colours, yeah. completely yeah. work a day, you know. I mean, below deck, so in the hold, for instance, it was all lime wash, and that was for yeah. good reason. Yeah. But um, no, it would seem that there was a certain amount of aesthetics in mm. inside as well. Fascinating. I understand that one of your goals is to get people to the exhibit, or not only for the sort of naval military side of it, but for the social history side of it. What are people learning when they come to the Trincomalee about how the sailors lived and travelled as well as how they fought? We do occasionally get visits from uh, officers from the contemporary Royal Navy. And I said to one of them once, we were on the mess deck, and I said to one of them, sort of crouching to walk, you know, I said to him, um, I said, how many crew do you think, you know, there's on this vessel in the ship commission? And he looked around and he looked at the size of it and said, 80? And it's like, no, it's 240. So, you know, by modern standards, yeah. that's a lot of people on a small vessel. And they all slept on the same deck. And um, so, yeah, he was very surprised by that. And I think it's quite hard to put across what 240 people look like when they're crowded onto that ship. 
um, and being so cramped as it is as well with the height and so on. Yeah. But I think um, for people that probably uh, have, say, visited a ship like Victory, I think they might be surprised at the um, on a frigate mm -hmm. how everybody lived on one deck. So the officers really were only partitioned from the men by a, a small door, you know, uh, on the same deck and the differences in the life between them. So in our gum room, we have a table set for dinner with sort of quite pleasant willow pattern china, you know, and mm -hmm. it's quite a nice meal we've got set out there of roast chicken and things like that. And then, of course, you just walk a few steps away and there's the square wooden platters of the yeah. crew and the sloppy looking stew that they have on there. So I think that the hierarchy they really were rubbing up against each other on a ship like Trincomalee. Yeah. Whereas Victory, you know, the, the officers and crew were very much separated. So one of the things that we've learned during the podcast is that there's a really active scene, or at least there was before COVID, for, of people in, involved in reenactment and doing kind of living history. Do you ever get, or does the Trincomalee ever get involved in people doing that kind of live history reenactment? Well, we do have our own staff do demonstrations of firing weapons on mm -hmm. the key side, so, which I think is, is quite an unusual thing in the museum, actually. Yeah. Uh, they fire muskets and they fire a gun, it's just a small cannon, out, out into the marina, which is always really popular. And I think, you know, there's nothing like actually hearing a, a gunfire and seeing it loaded and so on for really yeah. people to really understand it. Um so we do it in that respect. Also, I think uh, we do plan that Trincomalee would have some sort of live interpretation on board one day. Yeah. Warriors recently had, uh, Warrior has, I think it's three three permanent actors on board mm -hmm. and they play characters that are sort of real characters from Warrior's history. And I think we plan to do something similar with Trincomalee and the person that I think I would like to see would be the, the master shipbuilder mm. from India. Yeah. Because I think he would point out to people, you know, his craft and he would make people really look at the build of the ship. Because I think that's quite hard to get people to do when they're a lot of what they look at is set dressing. You know, they look yeah. at what people eat and they look at how the table's set and they look at the guns um, I want them to look at the ship, you know, I want them to look at the actual ship, the size of the ship, the decks, the features that maybe you could walk past. Mm. Um, whereas, so I, I think, you know, if we had the master builder there, he could say, you know, come and look at my craft. This is, this is how this ship was built. This is why it's important. It gets a really fascinating connection going as well with the, the ship's connection to Bombay and to India and the ship's connection to shipbuilding in the Northeast. Would the master shipbuilder have been an Indian or a European? Yes, he was. He was Indian. Um, he was from a, several generations, the same family, uh, very well respected, the Wadiers. Yeah. And um, the particular Wadia that, that built Trincomalee, he was the most celebrated, actually. It was the most celebrated period of, of the uh, Bombay shipyard. Um, and he was very well respected by the Royal Navy, he was given lots of awards and silver cups mm. and platters and all sorts of things for the for the work that he did. Um, and in pictures of him, you know, he looks really impressive. He's he wears sort of silks and wonderful um, scarves and shawls, and yes, you know, so I think he would be quite a spectacular and unusual figure to find in Hartlepool <laughs> as well. So. Oh, that would be awesome. So let's go back to books for a second, if that's okay, Claire. But I don't know what your reading habits are. Is there anything we can do to persuade you to have a book, Patrick <laughs> O'Brien? Well, I think I, I think he said to me, "Oh, is it a bit of a busman's holiday?" Yeah. It probably is. I mean, I do quite like historical fiction, um, mm -hmm. but I probably have steered away from that sort of thing because it does feel like, a little bit like work. But I am willing to be persuaded. <laughs> well, okay. 
one of the episodes of the show quite early on, I think episode seven, we took an old friend of mine who'd never read the books and asked him to read, read the first one. So have a listen to episode seven of the show and see what Jeremy thought. Um, the novel HMS Surprise, which is the third in the series that involves a, a journey to Bombay and a refit and a bunch of other shore-based shenanigans in Bombay is, is, is wonderful. I think you might really like it for what it's worth. I'm sure there are people listening to the show now shouting at their loudspeakers going, no, 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 tell her to read X, Y, Z. Oh, that sounds like the one that I probably should read first, the Bombay one, doesn't it? Yeah, great. And it's got it's got all of the elements that might cause you to be interested or not in the, in the other books as well. What's next then for an MRI in Hartlepool? We're, we're into, fingers crossed, we're into lifting of lockdown and hopefully more lifting of lockdown. What, what can people expect from the visit to Trincomalee? What, what kind of events have you got planned? Well, we have obviously the usual spectacular visits to, to HMS Trincomalee, but we also have a, a redevelopment of the Hartlepool site in hand because mm-hmm. um, we do want to bring it up to date with a bit more of the modern navy as well. So, obviously, we have Trincomalee in a, a sort of Georgian style seaport yeah. at the moment, but um, we're also hoping to acquire or build um, another building on our site. Um, so that we can show RML 497, which is a World War II vessel that we also have. She's yeah. currently in store, but um, yeah, at the moment, obviously, we can only tell the, a bit of the Georgian Navy history, but we want to bring it up to up to date. Uh, so hopefully, there'll be a bit of interest there for um, for other people who you know maybe prefer a bit more of the modern Navy story. Yeah, wow, oh, fantastic. Well. Claire, that's been really, really great to talk to you. Thank you so much for making time. We really appreciate having you on the show. Good luck with all the restoration. Good luck with the uh, the light blue interior. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and getting the Indian kit right sounds fantastic. Thanks again for coming on the show. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. So, Mike, really great to hear from Claire. Really great to hear those connections with the surprise. Interesting as well to hear those connections with the town of Hartlepool and our old friend USS Constitution, huh? It, it was. And, you know... I, I, I'm jealous. I'm envious that you got to sail to this interview. That I, yeah, yeah, you know, well done, sir. <laughs> well, it was a great trip. It was a great trip, but perhaps not as dramatic as the trip that Stephen and Jack are about to embark upon. Let's see what's happening there. Brilliant. We, you know, we go as as O'Brien often does. You know, he'll mention something in one paragraph and start with it again in the next. So we've just yeah. cut the line and it says the surprise sails westward along the line in waters that are generally unknown to them. But luckily, the specksioneer hog that we'd mentioned earlier from the whaling boat, he sailed them a number of times. The wind keeps dying off during the day. He assures them that this is typical here, probably happening to the Norfolk as well. So they really kind of quickly move to this return to the the daily ins and out of blue water sailing. They, they have very few concerns, but a couple, Jack and Moet are thinking that the reefers, these youngsters that they have, are, are really not attending to their duty as well as they could. So they, they work really hard to make life a little tougher for them. But the they are this young birth of midship and kind of remain cheerful. They even learn how to swim and sails over the side. And Jack and Moet, their other thing is that they have to reel in the whalers a little bit. The whalers have always you know, they've kind of grown up on democratic ships. Everybody speaks their mind. Everybody's actually kind of a co-owner of the of, of the ship and the load and the, and the gain. So they're peers and the crew just can't help themselves. They really have to play upon them the way they used to play upon Stephen. So <laughs> they would tell the whalers, you know, hey, you know, you want to make the captain happy you know, go ask him for a glass of his best whiskey because he really, he loves a four-mast hand. You know, he just loves that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and at one point, you know, they kind of, you know, they take this in tow. They don't really say much about it. They forgive a lot of things, but they they really get out of hand when the surprise passes an American whaler and doesn't go after her because they want revenge for their intrepid fox. But Jack doesn't want to delay chasing the Norfolk. So we move on. That's right. And this is about to become a really just kind of peaceful, calm moment. We've got the promise of a bit of a rapprochement between Stephen and Jack. We've got mostly calm feelings and good, uh, you know, good moods aboard the crew of the surprise. Stephen's reading the Iliad and he's playing music with Jack at night. And one night as the hands are singing and dancing on deck, Stephen is enjoying the moment and he sees 
an opportunity for a little bit of natural history. He's reaching out of the window of the cabin, trying to catch a phosphorescent organism with a net. And he falls in. Yeah. Jack sees this. He hollers, clap onto the cutter, because the cutter and the other boats are towing behind the ship. And he jumps in to save Stephen. And Mike, this is this is a shocking moment, but I, I think you and I both think, as, as this happens, as we read it for the first time, we think, this is okay. Jack's going to pull him out of the sea like he pulls everybody out of the sea and life is going to go on. But there's more jeopardy coming. Someone must have hauled the cutter forward. There are no boats towing behind. And it takes time for Jack to find Stephen. Stephen's underwater, sinking, on the verge of drowning. Jack hails and shouts for the surprise, but he's drowned out by all the singing on deck. And as the surprise pulls away, Stephen apologises to Jack for getting him into this very grave danger. And Jack starts off playing it very, very upbeat. He says, it's okay. Killick's going to notice that we're missing. They'll turn the ship around. And Stephen wonders if the ship could even see them with all the fog and no moon. Yeah, this I, I'm right with you there, Ian. It's like, oh, come on, this is easy. But all of a sudden, it's not easy. And, yeah. you know, Jack is now telling Stephen, you know, you're going to have to float as much as you can. We're going to float. We're going to swim and alternate uh, and, and wait for daybreak. And Stephen is thanking Jack for supporting him because Jack, you know, periodically just actually carries Stephen for a while. They get this really amazing little scene where there's this whale right next to them. And as dawn approaches, Jack realizes that if the surprise had turned back, if they, you know, the killing thing had come true, they would have they would have been by long before now. That means they probably aren't going to discover they're missing until the next morning. And given their late start and the uncertainty of backtracking, there's even less of a chance of Moet being able to find them. If he could, it wouldn't be until evening. And Jack is kind of looking at Stephen, thinking about where they are, looking around and going, yeah, and we're not likely to make it past afternoon. So I, it's funny, as you were saying it, I, you know, I, I sort of came back to this scene and I was thinking, gosh, I don't really remember being hit so hard. I mean, this is George R.R. R. Martin. I'd, I'd be starting yeah. to worry about we're, we're going to lose a couple of major characters here. And then it, it gets even kind of tougher. Jack is, is occupying his mind thinking about how, if you know, if only a piece of driftwood would come by, how could I best use it? Maybe what could I do? But you know, Brian tells us that he's thinking about this because he doesn't want to keep thinking about what O'Brien says is the piercing, sterile, pointless regrets that had tormented him for the last few hours. Regrets about leaving Sophie surrounded with lawsuits. Regrets for having not managed things more cleverly. Bitter regret at having to leave life behind and all those he loved. So I'm like, wow. Very, very tough. And it's brought Stephen and Jack together into this crucible of friendship and regret and nostalgia and and worry that is is washing away all of the uh, the discontent between them about abandoning the galapagos and i'm thinking well even even if they're going to get rescued or something is going to happen next i'm really affected by i'm re- really remembering this as one of the moments for jack you know reflecting and regretting and it's a sad place to be because we think of jack as the you know the positive optimistic outgoing one right anyway guess what this is not george r r martin this, my friends, is Patrick O'Brien. Right. And what do we have? We don't have a bear suit. We have a South Sea craft. And Mike, I'm just going to say, at this point, this is one of those moments that some of our readers um, will put alongside the bear suit as a moment that's just a little bit hard to follow. But do you know what? In recent weeks, we've seen on the internet that maybe the bear suit was a real thing. So maybe being picked up by a South Sea craft, having been dropped overboard, is a real thing. Anyhow, it's a great symbolic moment, and we're going to really enjoy some symbolism and some humor here. Jack sees what he calls a South Sea craft in the distance. He hails it. He wakes up Stephen, who was in something not far from a coma. He describes it as a very large, two-master, double-hulled canoe with a broad platform, a thatched house, and towering fore and aft sails. And I'm like, this is very hard to imagine. Right. <laughs> Even if you know something about the way you know, Polynesian boats are built. Two hulls, a thatched house, four and a half sails. This is is a creature very unlike any kind of vessel that we've ever seen before. An outrigger canoe, 
sets off from this double-hulled ship and comes from them. There's one woman steering and another poised to throw a spear at Jack and Stephen. These women are dressed only in kilts, but even the hot-blooded Jack doesn't notice their bodies. He doesn't notice their looks. It says he would not have cared if they had been old man baboon as long as they had rescued them. The women seem very surprised to find live humans in the water. They smile and laugh and turn the canoe back to the ship, appearing to motion for Stephen and Jack to follow. And I don't know if you've ever tried to swim after somebody in a canoe, but that ain't happening. <laughs> and anyhow, they're finally helped aboard. There's this kind of young, positive crowd of females on board this uh, this ship, and they they seem... Some of them are seemingly disapproving, middle-aged, older women, and lots of these women are heavily tattooed. Jack uses sign language to explain that they're hungry and thirsty. The older ones don't seem inclined to do anything, but the younger ones bring them food and drink. Jack and Stephen thank them for the rescue, again with sign language, thank them for the food, and the two young women who had originally come out to rescue them appear to be treating Jack and Stephen as their personal property. But one of them appears to be disgusted by the sight of Jack's water-wrinkled white skin, and the other, who we find is called Manu, washes her hands after she gets some of Jack's hair on them. So Jack and Stephen are clearly not seen as worthy and clean and compatible companions. They're something a bit dirty and a bit alien. And as we, as they watch, the crew seems to change over from one watch to another, and they start doing their chores for the day without any obvious signal. So there's obviously some kind of organization and some kind of collective thing going on here in this all-female crew. Yeah, and it's fascinating. Stephen kind of goes into his his natural philosopher, kind of intelligence agent sort of mode. He's watching the women. He's watching all the activities of the ship. He's kind of taking uh, you know, count what's the situation here. And there's about 20 young women, nine or 10 that other women that are between old and young on deck. And then they and here's many more in, in this house in the back, more women's voices here. Uh, most of them seem to consider the men unattractive. Uh, and a majority appeared not to approve of the rescue or of feeding uh, Jack and Stephen. Um, he mm. knows the ship, it's really well stocked. Perhaps they're on a long voyage. And then he sees at the back of the ship that there's this statue of three men sitting on each other's shoulders. And all three of the men are holding on to this huge penis, which is arising from the bottom man's loins. Now, Stephen notices that the penis is red and purple and has been recently hacked up with coarse instruments and that each of the men has also been castrated. So... So yeah, Stephen's starting to get some concerns here. And then he kind of looks over and he sees, one, a skull, and then what O'Brien writes are little wizened purse-like objects pinned to the slab as vermin might be to a European gamekeeper's door. Yeah, which so, sounds like the, the, the end result of castration to me. Exactly. I think for, you know, for guys, you know, that signed up for the mystery cruise, this is not the one you wanted to no, wake up on I'm, here. I'm, right? I'm shift, shifting awkwardly in my seat here, Mike. Can we move on? Can we can we talk <laughs> right. about filming billows, please? <laughs> right. So Stephen, you know, is kind of observing all this and he turns around to tell Jack kind of what he's surmised and to advise him that, you know, from now on, we got to be really submissive and meek and deferential and above all, no hint of gallantry, however innocent is what Jack what he was about to say. But Jack appears to have wandered off. And in fact, Jack has gone. Jack is doing Jack's thing. He's going to check out the ship. How is it constructed? How is it designed? And sure enough, he's with sign language. This woman has showed him the sails, showed him that instead of a rudder, they have this paddle, which moves up and down, uh, and, and it allows them to sail very close to the wind. And, and Jack's, you know, completely fascinated with this when three older women who O'Brien uh, writes are sort of like bosun's mates, they appear to be, come out of this house on the back. They spot Jack. They kind of, you know, drag him forward, kicking him, and they put him to work with a mortar and some dried roots. And then they grab Stephen and they have him attending to a young hog. And Jack notes that he's he's kind of watching the reaction of everybody, and he you know they they clearly don't like the look of him. But Stephen, perhaps they're they're a little bit less uh, uh, upset by because Stephen is almost as brown as them. And Stephen wants to tell Jack what he's found and to remind him of the prevalence of cannibalism in the South Seas. But instead, Jack interrupts him, saying, "You know, I'm thirsty, Stephen. Can you kind of get get 
you know, get that girl over there and bring us some more coconuts. And Stephen does. And Manu brings them uh, some coconuts and appears to be sternly telling them things for their own good. But of course, they have no idea what she's saying. And again, S- Stephen wants to share his observations with Jack. He wants to tell Jack that he thinks they're aboard a vessel belonging to women who somehow did not like men, who had revolted from the tyranny of men and were sailing away to some island, perhaps a great way off, to set up a female commonwealth. And to say that he dreaded the possibility of Jack's being gelded, knocked on the head and eaten. And this is it, it, It's funny because that's exactly what's on everybody's mind. And it's touching because, you know, their friendship is repaired again. Um, this jeopardy and this encounter with these women is taking them way past the point where Stephen was uh, was angry over the departure from the Galapagos. The captain of this ship is a short, stout, dark, handsome woman with a cross and authoritarian face. And she and some officers are heading over to to face up to Stephen and Jack. She's also accompanied by two tall women with weapons. The captain, we learn, as a little throwaway detail here, is nibbling on a pickled hand as she walks. <gasps> and Stephen, I can only imagine, I can just picture Stephen and Jack, who we learn are trying their best to look submissive. The captain talks with Tayo and Manu, who are the two women who were kind of the owners of Jack and Stephen who rescued them from the water. Stephen believes that these two women are of a privileged class. He notices that they're taller, that they're lighter skin, they have very different tattoos, and the captain appears to be much more civil towards Manu than she is towards the other. And Mike, it's interesting. First of all, we're getting a little bit of a parallel with um, the presumed voyage that some Americans are taking towards some kind of utopian paradise in the Pacific. Right. The women are off doing that for themselves. And we're also getting an episode of a bunch of women making their way independently in the world. And I'm sure it's no accident. This this is a coming not long after we've heard of the real disturbing and dark actions surrounding the conduct of one woman, Mrs. Horner, and after her affair with Holm. And it's also coming in the context of Stephen and Diana being in bad, in a bad way with each other, with Diana suspecting Stephen of adultery. So we're getting some really positive, rich, interesting, independent women alongside what has been some fairly downbeat coverage of the uh, of the female sides of these stories so far. You know, it, it's interesting. It, Stephen's been looking around and observing things. Jack tries to do the same and tell Stephen, I think they're rigging church. <laughs> and yeah. so, as this, this altar is set up and there's six mother of pearl discs and an obsidian knife laid out on top of the altar here. Uh, this ship's corporal harangues Jack and Stephen trying to, Tell them that, you know, kind of quit paying attention to this, pay attention to your jobs. And the younger girls who are behind this ship's corporal are kind of making fun of her, kind of imitating her. And this makes Jack laugh. Well, the corporal grabs one of these weapons that's designed to kind of puncture your skull with a single blow and comes Oof. after Jack, but gets there and only kicks them. And I think it's about to go on, but a shark is spotted. Everybody pays attention to the shark and Manu grabs the obsidian knife from the altar, slips into the water. Behind them, they hear this sign of desperate thrashing. And the next thing you know, Manu is back on the boat and deposits the disemboweled thrashing shark astern. Man. Wow. Whoa. (laughs) So we thought Stephen was badass. By the way, there's, there's a bit of connection to Stephen badassery here. What's the knife made of? It's made of obsidian. What else was made of obsidian? The phallus object that Stephen bludgeoned two French agents to death with in a Boston hotel room. So obsidian, I think it has some significance here. Uh, By the way, I think, Mike, is it right to say obsidian is the material that can kill the White Walkers, the undead in Game of Thrones? Exactly, exactly. So, boy, it's obsidian everywhere we look. And and also, everywhere we look, we've we've got killed sharks. It took a whole crew of men to catch and disembowel a shark aboard HMS Surprise about three chapters ago. It takes... One slip of a girl with a knife between her teeth to slide over the <laughs> over the side right. into the water and take care of the shark. Stephen and Jack are outclassed in every department here. Well, this ceremony starts in earnest, having having rigged church here. The drums are beating hypnotically. Jack tells Stephen in the midst of this, he needs to go to the head. He says, you know, I think it was that dried fish they gave me. And Stephen says, look, you know, go and jack says but but i have to take my pants off and steven says well you know slip in between the halls 
relieve yourself and get back here because I think this ceremony is about to end. So Jack does, gets back in time. The drums are ending and the captain is starting to kind of talk very passionately and pointing at the men. And then the people in the back bring fire in this bowl to the altar and the captain and the middle-aged women start drinking this kava that Stephen had saw them prepare in the morning. And Stephen's kind of hoping, I hope this is not the fermented, you know, alcohol hallucination kind of inducing stuff, but I think is afraid that it is going to be. Yeah. The captain gets more and more aggressive, appears to be blaming the men, the older women all around her, you know, kind of echoing her words. But some of the younger women are holding back and Manu keeps interceding and even interrupting her. Mm. So Stephen's now really convinced that she must have some sort of special relationship with the captain. And as Manu interrupts, she keeps pointing towards what O'Brien writes is a little patch of white unmoving cloud over the bow. This is Chekhov's cloud, I think. Oh, Chek- you're right. It's got to be Chekhov's cloud. <laughs> That's right. And Finally, the captain is, she's grabbed this knife again. You know, she's swipping it around. She's telling these women to come forth with these cords. But Stephen senses that she's really no longer in control. Manu is able to interrupt more often now. And as the women come close with cords and clubs and Manu interrupts again, Stephen stands, points at Jack's loins and says, Ba, 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 taboo, <laughs> which uh, O'Brien tells us is now the third word that Stephen has remembered in this Polynesian language here. And it has, O'Brien writes, it had an instant effect. Taboo, they said. Taboo in every tone. Affirmation, astonishment, and concern. Every tone but that of skepticism. The tension <laughs> fell at once. The club bearers moved away. And Stephen sat down again with his hog, which had begun to whimper. He paid little attention to the subsequent discussion, which went on in a more normal tone. Though he did notice accusations, tears, and reproaches. Whoa. Well, this is a, a bit of a climb back up the status pyramid for Stephen, who was right. previously outclassed in, this, in the shark disemboweling stakes, but he's really proving his worth in the spying and language stakes. Masterful intervention. He's combined his knowledge and his skills as an observer, as a naturalist and a linguist and a philosopher and an intelligence agent. And in a way, kind of similar to Manu with his special relationship towards the captain of the ship, Stephen is kind of claiming a special relationship here. This disagreement that we had just half a chapter ago between Jack and Stephen has turned into Jack saving Stephen's life and now perhaps Stephen saving Jack's. I'm like, this is really great storytelling. I, I don't think we got this in the movie. Um, we hear rumors this week that a new prequel could be coming right, along. Right, but right. This, this is a great little moment of storytelling. Wouldn't it be great if this had found its way into the movie? Well, can you can you imagine what Netflix or HBO would have done with a you know a whole boatload full of, of incredible women in kilts who can wrestle sharks today? <laughs> it would have been phenomenal. Yeah, I'd pay. I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd pay right now. Yeah. Jack notices, meanwhile, that the ship has altered course and we're now headed towards Chekhov's cloud. That little white patch of cloud on the horizon. I wonder what it can be. The captain and her officers go back to their house. Stephen and Jack are relieved of the duties. I don't know whatever happens to the hog. Um, they're taken to the starboard hull and they are actually fed. Um, but the, the earlier cheerfulness and merriment and curiosity that we had, especially from the younger women, has become flatness and gloom. And even Stephen and Jack themselves are taken over by it. Manu, their friend and savior, brings the outrigger canoe around. She's going to take them to the island. And she had clearly been crying. And Mike, we get straight to the next beat in the story in this closing, almost throwaway paragraph that wraps up the chapter. It was, we learn, a charming little island, not 10 acres, in an infinity of sea, green in the middle with a grove of palm trees, a brilliant white strand all around, and surrounding the whole, a broad coral reef 200 yards out. Manu obviously knew the island. She put the canoe through a gap in the reef so narrow that the outrigger clipped weed from the far side. She rounded to a few yards from the shore, and as Jack stood there up to his middle, turning the canoe, she gave him, (laughs) very generous gift here, she gave him two mother-of-pearl fish hooks and a length of fine line. Then she hauled in the sheet. Jack shoved her off, and the canoe raced back for the gap with the strong breeze abeam, and Manu, standing up, braced against it, as lovely a sight as could be imagined. 
They waved until she was far out at sea, but she never replied. Whoa. What a fascinating chapter. You know, certainly, certainly no idea this from the movie. And and here, what a fabulous fan fiction alternate reality, the tales of Stephen and Jack, you know, living yeah. with Amazons the rest of their lives, living off of this island the rest of their lives. And here we have these Amazons, you know, kind of, as you were saying earlier, yeah, making their way independently in the world, kind of the way Sophie manages everything at home yeah. and Jack is gone and probably better than that. The way Diana kind of got through all her early troubles and kind of made a life where there was none. Uh, and continues to do so. And we've had all these regrets about Sophie. We had the events of the Gunner and Mrs. Horner and Hollem. And now, you know, we got this very different view of women. We've got this potentially life altering perspective, a wake up call for Stephen and Jack here about what's really important. As you say, I don't I don't think they're going to be upset about missing the Galapagos at this point. No. And so they've been they've been rescued by this really bold and self-independent female civilization they've been rescued by the persuasive power and the and the unselfishness of young women facing down authority right right and this is this is a wake-up call for all of us it's especially a wake-up call for Stephen and jack provided mike provided they don't die alone on this blooming island Right. So, I mean, this is it. I mean, you know, you got a couple of, of fish hooks, you got some fish lines, you're two guys. We said Moet could not have found them, you know, probably where they were floating by backtracking. How in the world on, you know, on all the islands in all the South Pacific are, are we going to get off of this one? I guess there's really only one way to find out. What do you say, Ian, next week to a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? With all my heart. are little wizened purse-like objects pinned to the slab as vermin.